You no longer have to live by the approval yeah, yeah, yeah. of others. Amen. When you experience the yes. heart yes. of the Father, yes. you don't need to seek validation in people. Amen. When you experience the heart of Father God, you have come to the realization that the creator of heaven yes. and earth loves little yes. old you. Yes, amen. You see, someone who knows the real you. Amen. The fake you. Amen. The messed up you. Amen. The insecure you. Amen. The doubting you. Amen. The inconsistent yes. you. Amen. Even with all of that knowledge about you, Come on. Father God Come on. still loves you. you. Yes, you are. Amen, God. When you have experienced the heart yes. of Father God, yes, yes, yes. you have arrived yes. in a place mm -hmm. to where you begin to understand that God Almighty thinks about mm -hmm. you more than you think about you. So on this special day, as we honor each man who's a father and those who have been fathers to us, let me welcome you all to experience the heart of a father. Go with me to the book of Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. I want to say, pray. I thank God this morning for the youngins. So we got a youngin back there uh, uh, playing the role of Mr. Maris, running the projector. Thank you. I don't know why y'all clapping. Y'all getting busy too, you little jokers. Y'all getting busy. <laughs> So amen. I got a chance to see them yesterday. If you've got time on Saturday, and man, y'all need to come see these kids play basketball. Amen. They be balling out. Oh, yes. You got that on now, so they're going to mess yes. up all my ebonic language and all that. <laughs> uh, well, they was balling out of control. I mean, I stayed for another game after that. I, can't, I stayed for a game after that, and Jeremiah team was playing and they beat this team. They beat the brakes off this team. The score was like six to forty seven. The scoreboard. Yeah, they yeah, they should have stopped the score. It was discouraging. But 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 all in all, they did good. If you have your Bibles or you're able to look up this morning, let's read from the Gospel of Luke, beginning in chapter fifteen, verse eleven. Are we ready? Yes. Let's read. Then he said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that falls to me. So he divided his estate between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and journeyed to a distant country and there squandered his possessions in prodigal living. When he had spent everything, there came a severe famine in the country, and he began to be in want. So he went and hired himself to a citizen of that country who sent him into the fields to feed his swine. He would gladly have filled his stomach with the husks that the swine were eating, but no one gave him any. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have an abundance of bread, and here I am perishing with hunger. I will rise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he arose and came to his father, but while he was yet far away, his father saw him and was moved with compassion and ran and embraced his neck and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. 
and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring here the fat calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to be merry. May the Lord add a blessing on his word this morning to the hearers. May it penetrate the secret crevices of our hearts that have hindered us from becoming and fulfilling the full potential that Father God has placed in us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated in the house of the Lord this morning. Yes. I need a If you don't mind this morning, I'm going to transition a little while. I think I didn't, the anointing didn't wore off on the stage. Amen. So we find ourselves in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, where listening to a parable or a story that Jesus has told. And the reason that Jesus gives us this story is out of a response to hate. Some folks who thought they knew God were hating on Jesus for hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. But for them to actually hate on Jesus, they had to ignore all the good that took place. I can just imagine some of those religious folks. These are the folks that said they know Jesus, right? These are the folks that know the scripture. These are the folks who search the scriptures. I can just see them running around talking. He's running around here acting like he's somebody, claiming that he know God, but chopping it up with sinners and people who don't go to church. See, it didn't matter that when Jesus hung around sinners, people were saved. To these people, it didn't matter. It didn't matter to these people that when Jesus kicked it with the thieves, the thieves stopped stealing and started worshiping God. You see, it didn't matter that when Jesus spent time with the adulterers, they stopped sleeping around and started worshiping God. It didn't matter to these religious folks that when Jesus went to a funeral, people stopped crying and started praising God because the dead came back to life. While these religious people, these folks who are, are anointed to point that critical spiritual finger out and find hot past 99 things that are going right to, to troubleshoot one, uh, while these type of folks were inside of their church peeping out of the windows with their long judgmental fingers pointed at Jesus, Jesus was outside of the church. See, Jesus was in the alleys and at the parks and at folks' homes and at homeless shelters Praise preaching the good news. Praise See, Jesus was forgiving the sinners of their sins. He was cleansing the lepers. He was healing the sick and the afflicted. He was feeding thousands of hungry people with a sack lunch and delivering those who were held bound by demonic activity while they were playing church, looking outside, pointing their little critical than thou finger at God. See, it was, it's with the word of caution this morning that I want to warn you, my brother and sister, if you have made your mind up that you will walk with Jesus, talk like Jesus, don't be surprised if folks start talking crazy about you like they did Jesus. You see, if the religious people found fault with Jesus with the resume he had, 
surely they might find a little fault with you and I. You see, verse 11 says, then he said a man had two sons. This parable, it, it seems like the story evolves or involves only three main people in the story. You see, the, the, the father, the younger son, and the elder son. It's as if the story takes place on a, on a hill or, or, or a high hill in total isolation with only the father and his two sons in the story. But however, in the biblical times in which this parable was told, agricultural land was scarce and family farms were not large. Stay with me. Farmers never lived on their farmland because they didn't want to waste the little bit of farmland that they had building houses on. So instead, the people lived in small little compact villages. They called them insulas. And from there, they would go out to the village, to, to the farms or their farms to go work on them. You see, these insulas were made up or these villages were made up of family members and close relatives and everyone who knew each other quite well. Children grew up around Nana and Tata and Grandmama, Big Mama, aunts and uncles, cousins, as well as other neighbors. So it was a community that, 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 that was around these three main characters. And it appears that the mother of the, of the two boys and the wife of the father, that she had passed away. And perhaps it was after the birth of the youngest son, or perhaps at the time when she passed away, the father stood at the grave with his two sons. And as he stood there um, grieving over the wife, maybe he reinforces his love for his two, child, two children, giving them some added assurance that he'll always be there for them, providing support and comfort for his two boys who lost their mother. And maybe in the process of being an awesome provider, he overcompensated for the boys for not having a mother by allowing them to live a sheltered life. A life that gave the two boys not just everything they needed, but also most of the things that they wanted, you see? But who could blame this father if he wanted to overindulge in his kids once in order to take their minds off of losing their mother? the deceased mother. Who could, who could fault this, this father if that's the route that he took? Uh, uh, but, but, but I got a footnote to make in that process of overcompensating. I want to say to fathers this morning, be cautious of trying to overcompensate, giving your kids stuff and money and, 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 and things in order to make up for other areas of deficiencies like your time. Yeah. Uh, I say that because, this is why I say that this morning, because the younger son became bored of the good life. Mm. Just stay with me. I'm going somewhere. It's going to take me a minute just to make it all stick, but pray for me this morning. Yeah. You see, the younger son must have somehow got tired of living the good life. You know, you can only buy so many iPhones. You can only buy so many games and toys. You can only purchase so many, many or so much stuff before the child goes from thankful to entitled to ungrateful. So the youngest son, son starts, since the surgery, y'all gotta excuse me because my words, my tongue is still numb and I can't get my words out as fluent as I want to. So the youngest son starts dreaming. He's dreaming about a place other than where he resides, other than home. He's dreaming of an experience other than what he has already experienced. The younger son dreams of a far country. What would it be like? 
to go out there in the world? What's it like being in control of my own life? Not having my father around to oversee all my actions while some of the young boys might have slipped off in the night and ran away. Some might have asked another person to come and advocate their dreams to their father for them. But not this young boy. No, sir, not this younger son. This one son feels free to come right to his father. In verse, verse uh, 12, it's, he says, Father, give me the share of the property that falls to me. So he divided his estate between them. Now, from our modern day Western perspective, this request for his inheritance might seem just a little selfish, not too far outside the box. You see, it wasn't from our perspective on how we live and how we were raised and our environment being raised in the United States that wasn't completely out of, the, out of bounds or out of pocket. We might think that he is a young man who is anxious to make his way in the world. However, in traditional biblical culture, to ask for the inheritance while the father is still in good health would be to say that the son is anxious for his father to die. Mm -hmm. Let me say it another way. The way in which the son put forth his petition was similar to saying to his father, you mean more to me dead than you do alive. This request would have brought tremendous shame on himself and his family. For the younger son, you see, for the youngest son who's making this request, for him to get his portion of the inheritance, the father would need to give the other son his portion of the inheritance. Are you with me? So based upon the laws that, were, that, that, are, that are biblically based, sound laws, the youngest son would get, the oldest son would get two-thirds of the inheritance while the younger would get one-third of the inheritance, you see. So the father now must divide his entire estate, one-third to the younger son and two-thirds to the oldest son. Now what started off as an in-house family issue is becoming a public matter. The neighbors might have thought before this happened that the youngest son was a problem before, but when they saw the younger son selling his property, selling the farm and the tools, they knew this boy had lost his mind. My brothers and sisters, even in one of the darkest places in this story, I can still see the heart of the Father. You see, for the son to make such a shameful request to his father, it shows that this father was approachable. Mm. Hmm. As a parent, or as a father or a mother, can your child come to you when the report card sucks? Hmm. When your daughter has made the poorest of choices, are you approachable? Do you start fussing and cussing? Can they come to you without the fear of rage? Come on here, somebody. It gets quiet when we start talking about folks that step the Bible. <laughs> or do you just shut down and silently stew in anger? Are you approachable? If they can only come to us as parents uh, when they have made the right choice, made the best grade, then you have neutralized your ability to lead. If you are not approachable, you have nullified your right to speak into my life. 
So even with the shameful request, the father shows that he is approaching. Verse 13 says, not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and journeyed to a distant country. And there squandered his possessions in prodigal living. The younger son has gathered everything together. What does that mean? What has he gathered together? And Jen, you see, let me say it another way. The son moved quickly and sold his inheritance he, by splitting the, the family farm. You can't pack up a farm, so he had to liquidate all of his assets into currency. So the son moved quickly and started selling stuff, right? Selling the farm, turning it into cash, and he got out of that village as quick as possible. The Bible says that he traveled to a distant country or a far country. As Jesus is telling this story, stay with me, the Jewish people knew that when he said a distant country or a far country, it wasn't a Jewish country. They knew that Jesus meant that the son went to live in a Gentile nation. There, the text says, the son squandered his money in wild living until all of it was gone. At this point, for the young man, I don't think he had to fast or pray too long, but at this point, the smartest thing to do would be for him to go back home back to his own people. At least that would be my recommendation. Wouldn't that be yours? But here lies the problem. By Jewish custom, there is a ceremony called the kazaza. The kazaza means cutting off. It would be performed if a Jewish boy lost his inheritance to a Gentile. Stay with me. <laughs> and he would not even be allowed to return or have anything to do with the community. The prodigal knew that when he left, that he better come back with all of his inheritance of that money and it better be intact or he would face huge public shame and be completely cut off from his family and from his past. The text says that he squandered his money in wild living until it was all gone. There is a saying that the older generation uses that goes, a fool and his money are soon parted. When I was growing up, I thought this was biblical. <laughs> I thought it was a verse because it sounds biblical, right? You know, it sounds like it's a parable, but it's, it's, it's not actually biblical, but it comes from a verse that is biblical. It comes from Proverbs chapter 21, verse 20, that reads, Wise people's houses are full of the best foods and olive oil, but fools waste everything they have. The son had lived like a fool and has come to a foolish ending. The son is also hurting in the worst way. He has no kind of family support. He has no friends for social support. He doesn't have a social network and he definitely does not have finances. This son really needs to go home. But, hmm. He's broken the rules of the community and done the unthinkable. Losing all of his inheritance to the Gentiles. He knows the Kazaza ceremony awaits him. Unless he can find a paying job and recoup the money that he has lost, the prodigal hires, so he hires, watch what he does folks, he hires himself out to a pig herder to feed the swine. But he is treated so poorly that he is about to starve to death. By going to this Gentile country and working for a Gentile, feeding his pigs, the storyteller, Jesus, is saying 
this young man has gone as far away from his family and from God as he can possibly get. This prodigal son finds himself having to feed pigs. This was in itself a very humiliating situation for the boy, not only because the work was distasteful and obviously roaming around in the mud side with the pigs, but God had told the Jews that the pigs were unclean animals. Now there is no other option left for this young man but to go home and ask for employment as a hired hand working for his father. Thank you. But how can he possibly, how can he possibly get his father to trust him and take him back? I mean, after all, he has burned all the bridges behind him. He has brought shame upon the family and the community. He has shown that he doesn't give a rip about his father. The boy is at his lowest and his best thought on his best day has landed him far away from home, broke, starving, and eating with the pigs. Verse 17, 18, and 19 states, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have an abundance of bread, and here I am perishing with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. You and I would think that the son was waking up. You know, they say everybody has a father. You would think he's He's lost everything. He's on foreign land. He doesn't know the people. He ha he's starving. He has no money. I mean, he he's at the lowest of the lowest. You can't get no lower than that. You know, that's what me and you could be thinking that, you see. He's a... Uh, at this point, this, we would think that the son was waking up. He's understanding the position that he's in. And we would think that he is truly sorrowful, that he feels bad for his father. For his father, and he's also remorseful because the Bible says he came to himself. He came to himself. Hmm. That boy learned his lesson, came to himself. But did you know that in the Middle Eastern and Arabic, Arabic, Arabic translation of this phrase, he came to himself, did you know that it paints an entirely different picture? than being sorry. <laughs> they translate Luke 15, verse 17 as, he got smart. He thought to himself, and he took an interest in himself. They never thought of him as repenting and returning to his father, but returning to himself. In other words, the prodigal has developed a plan to get himself, to get himself, to get himself out of this mess. You might say, what about the confession that he concocted in verse 18? I have sinned against heaven and before you. Was this son repenting? Was he sorry? Many of us say, I don't know, I don't care, I don't know. That's what the Bible says, right? Was his heart sorry for his actions? This is where sometimes where skimming over the Bible and reading the Bible comes, there's a vast difference because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, right, who were hearing this parable live in real time, they knew what he had said sounded familiar to them. When they heard that phrase, those, those scribes and the Pharisees, because in order to be a Pharisee, you memorize the whole the, the whole entire Old Testament. So they they could tell when something when you were 
when the scripture came up, when God's word came up. And, and it was something about what he said that, that, that gave them, uh, that sounded familiar. And, and, and lo and behold, this is the exact same phrase that Pharaoh said to Moses in Exodus 10, 7, 10 16, when he was trying to manipulate Moses into stopping the plagues. Everyone knew that Pharaoh was not repenting. He just wanted the plagues to stop. The prodigal son's statement that he had sinned was designed to produce the same result as what Pharaoh was hoping. He was trying to think of how he could soften the expected anger from his father and convince him to let him back on the family farm as an apprentice to one of his hired hands. There is no hint of remorse in his statements. He just, my, I'm sorry to say, he just wants to eat. This wayward son is still spinning his wheels. He is still trying to maneuver his father. If the son, if the son can recover the lost money through working his father, then he could feel reconciled and would have worked his way back. But this part of the story is interesting. And, and the, the reason I say it's interesting is because it ties back into salva the salvation message. Because the son is trying to keep the law by working his way back to salvation. You see, and the way he's thinking, grace is totally unnecessary. If he can manage it on his own, the prodigal sees it only as a matter of lost money, just a broken law. However, the real sin is the broken relationship with the father. The son has done everything wrong up until this point. Now he has a plan to work himself back into the good graces of his father. The turning point of the story comes when the son decides to return home and appears at the edge of that village. He has worked on his speech, the memorized prayer, you know, there's no heart in it, just memorized, so I can repeat it back and forth. He got, he got his stuff down pat. I've said father, I've said before heaven. Do I say heaven first? Do I say father first? I say heaven. That's what he said. That's what Pharaoh said. That's what I'm going to say. Good. He has worked on his speech and he's bracing himself for the humiliation he will face when he tries to return to the family because he knows that the Kazaza ceremony is coming. He is empty handed and has insulted his family and his failure and is a failure in every respect. But what about the father? What about the father? You see, the father knew that his son would fail. He also knows how the village will treat his son when he comes home. He knows the Kazaza is coming. But the father is so full of love for his lost son that he has already thought of a plan to save. The heart of the father is on full display, my brothers and sisters. Out of the father's prevision, he has made provision for his son. Knowing that his son would fail, knowing that the boy would fall on his behind, since wisdom allowed the father to see the outcome of the boy's bad choices, the father made a way for his child to be restored to his family and community. Sounds a lot like another father who art in heaven, you see, who wanted to have children to love and reflect his image in a physical world. But his children blew it by falling into sin, severing the relationship between our holy God and sinful people. But God being all knowing had prepared a sacrifice for all sin before the foundation of the world was made. He did this through Jesus Christ. Day after day, the father waits expecting. looking down the road that leads to the edge of the village. When he sees his son coming, 
he will run out to meet the boy before he gets too close and welcomes his son back and protects him from the wrath that will surely await him. If he can reconcile with his son in public, no one will treat his son badly. However, however, to achieve this goal, the father has to humiliate himself in front of everyone. Verse 20 says, so he arose and came to his father. For while he was yet far away, his father saw and was moved with compassion and ran and embraced his neck and kissed him. The father sees the son while he is yet at a distance. The distance is much more than spiritual distance. It's much more of a spiritual distance than a physical gap that separates this son from his father. The father again, I know I say it again, the father again breaks the role of the middle age East, East, Eastern patriarch. How does he do that? He takes his long robes in his hand and runs through the crowded streets out to the edge of the village to meet his pig herder son. Out of great compassion, he empties himself and becomes a servant and runs to reconcile his son. Now, you might say, how did he humble himself? What, what was it that he did? By the father running, he was greatly humiliating himself. You see, tradition, traditional Middle Eastern men in biblical times wore these long robes and they never, and I mean never, ran in public because to do so would expose their legs and this was unheard of. Then as the father reaches the prodigal, he falls on his neck and begins to kiss him before he heard his son's prepared speech. The father did not wait for the son's confession of sin before he showed his love. He offered his grace first. The young man is totally surprised and is not able to get the rest of his, get past the first part of his speech. Overcome with emotion as to what is taking place, he can only say, I've sinned and am unworthy to be called your son and leaves out the part will let me work for you as a hired hand. He changes his mind about trying to work his father's love and, sur and surrenders his plan to save himself. His father has saved him first. Let me say that again. His father has saved him first. If we are to understand this scene, Jesus, the story that Jesus tells, it demonstrates the heart of the father. Instead of having to confess and make compensation and demonstrate sincerity to restore the sinner to God's favor, Jesus is saying, I've been waiting for you and my grace is sufficient to redeem you even in your lost condition. Just as the shepherd goes out to find the lost sheep and the woman diligently searches for her lost coin, the father must go out to find his lost son. The father didn't just sit in the house and wait to, to hear what the lost son had to say for himself. He gave himself in costly love by running to him at the edge of the village. The son has a choice to make. He can insist that he will work and pay as a solution to the problem, or he can surrender to grace and accept being found like the sheep and the coin. The heart of the father is beautifully on display throughout this entire story. In closing, you see, <clears throat> while the father was the furthest thing, or the furthest thought from the son's mind. The son was the closest thing to the father's heart. When the son ruined his father's finances, he was on the heart of the father. While the son was running around getting drunk, he was on the heart of the father. 
while the boy was sleeping around, he was still on the heart of the father. When the son relocated to a far country, he was on the heart of the father. While the son was broke and hungry, he was on the heart of the father. While the son was working and eating with the pigs, he was still on the heart of the father. Simply put, the father kept his heart in a place of reconciliation. On this Father's Day, my desire is for fathers to keep your hearts in a place of reconciliation. Some of us have children who don't listen. Some of us have children that we haven't seen or spoken to. Some of us have children that are grown and angry. They may be grown physically, but emotionally, they are stuck inside of childhood wounds. If we were to ask the father of these two boys in this story, how'd you do it? How, how, how did you, how did you do this? How did you forgive your son? How did you get to a place to where you and your son have a functional relationship? I believe that father would have said, I remained approachable and I stayed in a place of reconciliation. Mm 